Hey, it's good to be with you on this uh, December the 18th. Here it is, uh, seven days until Christmas, and uh, what a wonderful time it is. Uh, someone said this, that the greatest thing about Christmas morning is the surprises. I don't know, you, in your tradition or culture, what all that brings. Now, in the country of Chile, where our daughter lives, our Kay and our son-in-law Leo and Sophia and Benjamin, uh, Christmas is not emphasized a great deal. I mean, there's not much celebration about it. New Year's, yes, but not Christmas. But anyway, uh, sometimes somebody said, where else can you be near a Christmas tree in your home and if you have a number of people, maybe seven, eight, 15, 16 people come and you celebrate and you bring gifts and put them under the tree and then you distribute them and then one at a time go around and somebody opens their gift and they thank the person who gave them that gift and they go to the next person and they express their surprise and such. Well, one Christmas uh, I remember uh, I would see these uh, beautifully wrapped gifts. Uh, in in stores and places and uh, a young man Co. he already wants this one so he's already raised his hand he thinks I'm giving him out but anyway uh, Jane said you get back home with that gift <laughs> you don't forget it today but you bring it home and I said who's it for we won't go into that but anyway I remember uh, just going around the house and I didn't have any I was eight or nine ten years old and I didn't have any money and uh, but I want to give gifts to people members of my family well you know you you just wrap it up in about anything a napkin and put scotch tape around it it wasn't beautifully wrapped and uh, I would find a, a piece of wood or maybe a pencil and wrap it up and put grandma from Bill <laughs> And Dad from Bill on the next one, and Florence from Bill, and Virginia from Bill, and Mary from Bill, and Charlie from Bill. And these presents begin to appear under the tree. About a week or they caught on to it pretty quickly. And uh, they ask about it, and I, you know, I suppose I was surprised that they found out about it, but it didn't work. And I had to admit, I'm just picking up anything and wrapping it and giving it to somebody. Well, when we think about the Christian life, how wonderful it is. It is a wonderful life. Well, one evening a professor was going through his mail and his housekeeper had laid what had come in the mail that day on his desk and he was working on the next day's lecture at school where he was a professor. And he noticed one magazine and uh, he noticed in it uh, he discarded most of that, you know, you get in the mail, you get the circulars and it ends up and I tear it up and throw it in a waste basket and most of that ended up like that for him. Well, he noticed the magazine, it wasn't even addressed to him. It was addressed to somebody else and mistakenly the postal carrier had put it in his mail and, and there he was and he began to flip through and he noticed an article and it said the needs of the Congo mission and it, the needs of the Congo mission or the needs of at that time that's what that country is called the Congo in Africa and here are the needs and he began to read the article very carefully and as he read that article um, he, he, um, he read it and it said the need is great here we have no one to work the northern province of that country in the central Congo. And it's my prayer, the, the writer of the article said, it's my prayer that as I write this article, that God will lay his hand on someone, the one whom already the master's eyes have been cast on that person. And they'll read that article and they'll respond. And he'll be called to this place to help us. Professor Albert Schweitzer closed the magazine, he laid it down, and he got in his diary, and he wrote four words, my search is over. He read the magazine. Now, it was hidden, there was an article hidden in that magazine, 
It wasn't even addressed to him. It came to his place, we would say, by mistake or coincidence. And he noticed the title. And the title of the magazine, The Needs of Those in the Congo, it just jumped out at him as he read. Is it by chance? No. You see, it was one of God's surprises. And God does that. And what he asked us to do, we want to have, as Brenda Young from the state of Ohio said at family camp, quick obedience. Quick obedience. Even in this Christmas season. Well, it is a wonderful life that we are called to in Jesus Christ. Um, you'll notice in your outline in the bulletin, you'll see the first thing is that, that Jesus coming in the world means, it means hope for the hopeless. The hopeless. I don't know if you've ever been in a position where you just say, the circumstance I'm in, it's hopeless. You've been there. I've been there. I'm sure you have been in different circumstances. And it comes along. And things really look dark. It may be a job situation. It may be furtherance of education. I think in the area north of us or northeast of us at Marion, Indiana or Kokomo, Indiana, it's, they're big on building cars. And the economy has really hit, hit them hard. And the unemployment rate. And in the state of Indiana, what is it now in Illinois? I'm not certain, but Indiana, it's about 10% or so. And finances, and we think of family relationships, and we think maybe of a death or death of a loved one or loved ones uh, or illness. Now, each year at Christmas time, it seems like TV stations, they program, they just bring out of their storage even the old black and white movies. And they show them. And, um, well, I have to confess, Jane, I mean, it, it, you can begin at 8 o'clock in the evening and go to 9, and that's a one-hour deal. And then, uh, or maybe 7 to 8, and then 8 to 10 is a two-hour deal, and then 10 to 12, and there's so many commercials that if you had it on DVD or something, you'd probably only watch about, <laughs> out of an hour, you might watch 35 minutes, and all the rest, or 40, and the rest is commercial. But it's interesting to, to look at those films. And they seem to have a good moral uh, uh, aspect, uh, emphasis to them. And they still relate to people's lives. I don't know if you've seen the one that it's called It's a Wonderful Life. And the lead character is George Bailey. And he's played by the late actor Jimmy Stewart. Anyway, just follow along in the sequence in the, uh, of the story. And George Bailey never felt that he amounted to much in life. I mean, he dreamed of becoming a famous architect. He wanted to travel the world. Well, instead he feels trapped in a humdrum job in a small town. He just feels trapped. And you may today, there's maybe some feeling of trappedness in a job or in what your situation is. And then a crisis occurs that strains every financial resource he has. He, has, he faces an unjust criminal charge, George Bailey does. And uh, although George has a fine family and many friends in his community, still the wrongness of the situation affects George. And he goes into despair. We might say he goes into depression for a while, but he's in despair. And uh, he considers suicide. That's when George Bailey's guardian angel, and his guardian angel is the name in the movie anyway, is called Clarence. His name is Clarence. And he comes to show George what his, his town, his community would be like if George wasn't there. And so they take a look at their community and, they, and, and he shows him this. Well, the angel takes him back through his life. And uh, he tries to point out to George, he does point out to him, how he has helped a number of people, a number of families. He shows George how his acts of kindness and thoughtfulness have helped change the lives of others. Now, as I mentioned, George Bailey is played by the late Jimmy Stewart the actor and he said Jimmy Stewart said that things happened to him actually happened to him 
that never happened in any film he had ever made. For example, he said in one scene, he's at a roadside restaurant, uh, at a restaurant in a side booth, and he's in despair, and he sits in that restaurant, and uh, he raises his eyes, and he begins to talk to God. This is part of the script, but here's how Jimmy Stewart described it. And uh, he pleads with God. He prays, show me the way. Show me the way, God. And God, God, dear Father in heaven, I'm not a praying man. But if you're up there and you can hear me, show me the way. And I'm at the end of my rope. Show me the way, O oh Lord. And he prays that as part of the script and his comments. Then he said, as I prayed those words, as I prayed them, I felt the loneliness. I felt the hopelessness of people who have nowhere to turn. And my eyes filled with tears. It wasn't, it wasn't in the script, but he said, I broke down right there and I sobbed and I cried. It wasn't planned at all, but God's power and that prayer. And it reduced the actor, Jimmy Stewart, to tears. And here's a point. Don't grow weary in doing good. You may want to jot it down and listen and read it later, but I want to read it to you from the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter number 6, verses 9 and 10. And it goes like this, Galatians 6, verses 9 and 10. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Now that is found in Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. And I trust it will be helpful to you and, and, to, and to myself, to you, that Jesus' coming means hope for the hopeless. And that when he came, that's what happened. And he's been that ever since. And he is this morning to us. Hope to the hopeless. And we've been there in the hopeless situation. Nobody is exempt from that. But hope to the hopeless. But also, secondly, you'll notice in the outline, in the bulletin, Jesus coming into the world means healing for the hurting. Well, let's go back to Isaiah 35. And you read that. I want to read it again and listen carefully to it. Now, you'll hear it in English instead of Korean. <laughs> Believe me, you will. But anyway, um, in, in Isaiah chapter number 35... Beginning at verse 1. Now there's a title of this chapter and it says Joy of the Redeemed. And, and so anyway, I, I just want to read verses 1 through 6 this time. You read the whole chapter, all 10 verses previously. And here we go. Isaiah 35, verse 1. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will, greatly re it will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord. The splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands. Steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong. Do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness, and streams 
in the desert. Now, as I understand it best, Isaiah, the prophet in this book of Isaiah, in chapters 1, clear through 34, he's delivered a message of judgment on all nations for rejecting God. Well, now Isaiah breaks through with a vision of beauty and encouragement. God is just as thorough in his mercy as he is severe in his judgment. God hates sin. But God loves everyone and everything that he has created. He loves. This leads to mercy for those who have sinned, but who have sincerely loved Jesus and put their trust in him. Now, this is a magnificent picture of healing and new life. How many have ever lived in Chicago? I, leave, I know two of you have. Okay, yes, okay. In Chicago. And there was a, a businessman. He owned two places, two places of business. His name is Mark, and his wife's name was Debbie. And he, Mark was a big burly man who had two transmission repair shops in the Chicago area. And he called them something like a multi-state transmissions. If you looked up and if, if you tried to find his number or if you saw it, it, said multi, it says multi-state transmissions. Two businesses. Two places of business. Well, Mark's wife Debbie was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And as Mark watched the woman he loved suffered, he tried to think of some way that he could help her. Well, he prayed for her and he prayed more. And then instead of advertisements for oil changes and brake spatials, the signs at multi-state transmissions read like this. On both, at both businesses there was a sign board and he put this message up there. Please pray for Debbie that the cancer will go away. Wow. Two business places. Please pray for Debbie that the cancer will go away. Well, when we say that, uh, customers began stopping by to ask about Debbie. And uh, he began, Mark began personally asking customers and business associates to pray for his wife. Well, months passed. And Mark noticed a change in his wife and he himself. Actually, it is said that Mark became, he, he, was, he had grown very cynical about human life. He had become very cynical and very caustic or very short in his answers. And, well, nobody liked to have to get their car fixed. You like to get your car fixed? Oh, it's wonderful to be able to get it fixed, to have the money to be able to fix it. But when something goes wrong with your automobile or your truck or your motorcycle, I didn't say your skateboard, but I just said your car, or your truck or motorcycle. Oh, my. They say $3,000 to repair it, or you'd be better off to trade it in and forget about this. There can be some, you know, car repair customers can be kind of rude and grouchy. And Mark was tired of dealing with unhappy people. But after posting the signs about his wife's cancer, he was amazed at the outpouring of love and support for his customers, even total strangers. They wanted to know how Debbie is doing. They said, we're praying for her. Um, a few days before Christmas, Mark and Debbie got the news that her cancer was gone. Gone. It's gone. So he changed the signs on his two businesses. And now he put up there, he, um, he posted new signs. And it said, praise God, Debbie is winning her battle with cancer. Wow. On both signboards. Now, not everybody wins their battle with cancer and some other diseases. My father didn't. He died of bladder cancer. 
He didn't win his battle with that, but he got to go to be with the Lord. That's right. Yes, he did. But, you know, we can all be, we may not be healed physically, but we can all be healed spiritually. We can. And if we need a healing spiritually, even before we leave here today, we can be healed in this place spiritually. Now, what about physically? Uh, This Wayne used to pastor what is now the Madison Madison Avenue Free Methodist Church. Now, where was it located before? Madison Avenue used to be someplace else. Okay. And what was it called? Was it called Urbana Free Methodist Church? Yeah. Okay. I think that's when he pastored here. He and Sherry. Uh, Sherry Neely. Okay. Anyway... Uh, They're back in Wabash Conference. They're pastoring at Washington, Indiana, and they served in the New South Conference and in Kentucky and and places like that. But he, they share about their prayers and their comments about their daughter, Wynette. Wynette Neely Hostetler. Wynette was a wife and the mother of two children, small, and she was a high school teacher. And in her early 30s, And she was living with cancer, and they lived in Bowling Green, Kentucky, but God gave Wayne, her dad, this assurance. And here was the assurance. Wynette would be free of cancer. Either the cancer would be gone from her body, or she would be gone from the cancer. Wynette, at that age, in early 30s, went to be with Jesus Christ. Healing. Spiritually, physically, mentally, ethically, morally, emotionally, materially, financially, socially. He brings healing for the hurting. Now you'll see in the outline, number three, Jesus coming into this world means joy for all who believe. Joy for all who believe. Now, um, I have to resist today. <laughs> I'm, I was going to tell you, I'll tell you later about a blonde joke, okay? Because I don't see any of you, you would take it very well because I don't see anybody here that has blonde hair. Right? <laughs> So I'm not picking on anybody. I'm not even picking on myself when I got gray hairs and brown hair and black hair. And <laughs> but you know about the blonde jokes, and I'll have to tell that later. But anyway, his coming in the world means joy for, you know, to be able to laugh is good, isn't it? It's a healing. There's something about it in Scripture we read about a joyful heart, about healing, about help. And to be able to laugh. And it's very important to be able to laugh at ourselves. Right? Not just some joke intended for someone else, but laugh at ourselves. Well, I want to share this. And a man found great joy in collecting art from all over the world. This man had a son. His son learned to grow to like art as well and they traveled in different locations to discover very very important art pieces in their collection and they did that well one day the war broke out in their country and the son went off to be in the military for his country and a few weeks before Christmas the young man was reported missing in action and uh, he, he was missing in action and the father was filled with anxiety as he waited to hear from his son about it and then it came only days before Christmas the news arrived that the art collector's son had been killed in action his son had died a hero he had been trying to help a fallen comrade when he was killed the father didn't think he could, he could survive his grief and oh, how he loved his son, his only son. He couldn't bring himself to celebrate Christmas. He barely felt alive when he thought about his son's death and his son. 
But a knock on the door roused him from his grief that day. And there's a young soldier who stood in the doorway when he opened the door. He introduced himself as the person whose life had been saved by this man's son who was killed. And he saved his life. And he wanted to express his appreciation. And he wanted to give the man a gift. And the soldier explained that he too was an artist. And he had painted a picture of the man's son. Well, he did. It probably wouldn't mean much to many of us. The picture, painting that picture of that fallen soldier, of this man's son. And, and the dad, the father was amazed at the lifelike quality in that picture that he had painted, that portrait. He hung it in his office. And every time he went in that office, it brought him great comfort. It became his most prized work of art. I mean, he had prized works of art from around the world, but this picture, I mean, this painting of his son, this is number one for him. A season passed, and then the father died. Other art collectors around the world, they learned of his death. And then they learned that there was going to be an auction of all the masterpieces and, and the paintings that this father and his son had gone to different places in the world to collect. They were going to be sold at the mansion in which he lived. Well, uh, this, this, the day came for the auction. And the people crowded into that place, into that area where they had for the auctioneer. Uh, but a sigh of disappointment reigned over that crowd when they realized that, according to the man's will, that painting of his son was to be the first piece that was auctioned off. It really kind of got to them because they wanted to get to the real stuff, they thought. No, but they had that picture of that painting of his son and nobody made a bid in time. Finally, 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 a friend of the family bid $10. $10 for this portrait of his son. Ten bucks. And that was the only bid. No one else bid. But you see, that man who bid $10 was fond of the son. And he knew how much that painting meant to the father. And when the bidding was, when his bid was accepted... Actually, all the other collectors who were there, they were really happy because they're anxious to get on with it now. They'd get to the important stuff, but wait. The auctioneer put away his gavel, just put it away. He announced the bidding closed. The auction is over. What? We've come from different parts of the world and you're not auctioning off all the other pieces that's what we came for and after one piece is auctioned you close the bidding was he crazy well what about the rest of the ark the art and the auctioneer had a copy of the man's will and he stated it's all very simple according to the will of the father Whoever takes the son, whoever purchased the portrait of the son, gets it all. Oh. Ten bucks. Wow. Got everything. That's according to the Father, to the will. You know something, my friends and brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ? That's what Christmas is all about. It's what life is is all about. God has revealed himself to us. Now we are to want what he wants, a new human creation. And this is how it happens. When we take the Father's Son, Jesus Christ, we get it all. We get eternal life forever, but we get abundant life here. We get forgiveness. We get love. 
we get direction, we get guidance. Well, you'll see another thing, and that is, you'll see it in the bulletin. Number four, Jesus coming into this world means that we have a responsibility to reach out to others no matter the cost. Now, in Scripture, in the second chapter of Luke, verse 17, it goes like this. They spread the word. They spread the word. It's like you take peanut butter or butter or jelly or jam and spread it across a piece of toast. Oh, if you haven't had breakfast, you're hungry already. (laughs) But they spread the word of God. They spread the word. Let's say it together. They spread the word. He calls us to come to him and then instructs us not only to come to him, but then you go to others. How did we get to Jesus? Think back of the people who invested in our lives that we could know Him and receive Him as Savior and Lord and no sins forgiven by faith. Psalm 22, 30. Future generations will be told about the Lord. You know, unborn generations are depending upon our faithfulness today. Well, when I think about this... um, Do I know anything about the lostness of our world? How do I feel about that? I challenge you to be a vital part of God's rescue operation and be committed to sharing Jesus Christ no matter the cost. And we want to close with this. Now, Hagen's going to play a number. It's not what I'm going to share with you, but she'll play a number, and I want you to stand. But before you stand... uh, Amazing as it seems, George Frederick Handel, he wrote the entire sacred oratorio, Messiah, in only two weeks. And the ending of that Messiah is the Hallelujah Chorus. It lasts about four or five minutes. And when that was done, when that was performed, it's amazing what he did as God directed him. King George II was in attendance, and when he heard... The hallelujah chorus being played at the end of that, he he would spring to his feet and his entourage did too, and all the rest of the people in that great assembly sprung to their feet. Now, we want to take a cue from that, and, and as I understand, it's customary today, whenever you hear, whenever you're in a place and there's the hallelujah chorus, is to stand. Now, this is not going to be the hallelujah chorus, but just worship God. And, and, and just worship Him as we stand together today and listen to the music. Stand in prayer and praise unto the Lord.